Thank you, Heather. And uh, we're, we finished our series in 1 Corinthians, and so we would like to do a few. I kept saying to the pastoral staff, we're going to have a couple throwaway messages, and I realized that's probably not a good idea to, to call them that, but these are, these are standalones. We are going to do a summer series. You saw a little clip either on our Facebook page or you saw it on our website or even before service began, we played it. On, on the character of God, and we're looking forward to that series, and that'll take us all the way up through the first part of October, when we will then begin a series in 2 Corinthians. So we're going to do a, just a couple of little individual sermons here before we get into that. So while you're turning your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, I'm going to ask the little ones to go ahead and make their way to Children's Church. And, uh, you can make your way out through those back doors there to the Children's Church service that will be specifically designed for you. And the rest of you, make your way to Romans chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2. Very, very familiar passage of Scripture. And uh, some of you may be wondering where my better half is. And she's uh, going to see, little, she went to see little Laney for the sixth time in seven months. That's all I'm saying. And uh, little Laney came up to visit Melody's side of the family in Pennsylvania, and so Melody took advantage of a little of the holiday weekend. She took off on Thursday, and she's on her way back now. She should be home by the time we get done with our time here. She had a great time. I was extremely thankful yesterday when they sent a video of when they were visiting Melody's great-grandmother. And... Uh, they, they, they talked about, okay, we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this, and then we'll take the five-generational picture. And I'm going like, thank you, Jesus, I'm not there. Uh, you know, it's just like, because when Melody's family gets together, they start organizing. They're all organizers, and all of them want to be in charge. And with everybody in charge, I just want to cover my ears and walk out. Just say, you know, somebody make a decision. Let's stop with the discussion. But nonetheless, um, he had a great time. And uh, little Lainey got to inter be introduced to all of Melody's side of the family. So she'll be back safe and sound. Many others are traveling, I know. And so we're excited about the opportunity to see hopefully everybody back last week or next week. Um, but then I will be gone. So uh, I'll get to see you in a couple of weeks. I'm going down to visit my father and uh, do some work projects that he has for the summer down there for a couple of weeks. And uh, then we'll be back. And uh, Pastor Quarter and Pastor Woogie will fill in while I'm gone, and then we'll begin our, our summer series. But today, we're going to be in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. You know, this, this weekend, while I had a lot of lone time, one of the things that I love to do is watch movies, and so I watched a couple of movies, and one of the things that I did watch was a, a documentary, which was very interesting. I wasn't going to watch it, but it came on, and it caught my attention, and and it was a documentary on the evolving of fast food. That's like a gross subject in and of itself. But it was interesting to see how it, 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 it took place and whatnot. And what caught my attention was the, the, the way that the hot dog made it as became one of America's all-time foods. And, and, it, and, and it's associated most often with Coney Island and things like that. And there's this, there's this famous hot dog place that was Nathan's. You probably have heard of Nathan's. And, the, you know, it's world-renowned. What I found interesting, though, in this documentary is they talked about how the, the, there was animosity between the Germans and the Germans come from a very uh, sausage kind of a thing, and they brought the hot dog to America. And then, and then it, it just began to evolve, and it was very cool. This guy that started Nathan's Hot Dogs, he was in a major restaurant, and he was the, the bun slicer, the guy that cut the bun in half that you put your hot dog in it. Well, he, they, somebody told him he was too smart to be doing just that job, and he should start his own restaurant. And he started Nathan's, a, a hot dog restaurant. And uh, it became famous. But it, was, it got to a rough start. The reason it got to a rough start is that he was selling his hot dogs under the market value, the hot dog, when it came, when Nathan's opened up, they were selling hot dogs for 10 cents. Can you imagine that? I mean, wow. He decided 
the way he was going to get his business, he was going to put it right across the street from the restaurant that he used to cut those hot dog buns into. He was going to put it right across the street, and he was going to sell his hot dogs for five cents. Now, it's a good marketing strategy. You know, you flood the market with cheaper product, people will buy. But it didn't happen that way. It actually came back to bite him a little bit, and he, he had a problem. Because at that time, some of the news, like we hear today, was about the meat markets and some of the unsanitary practices. And so people were worried that his hot dog meat was cheap meat, and so they were afraid of it. And so they wouldn't come. They would go spend 10 cents across the street because they thought, because it was costing more, and those of you that are in marketing know that this is a ploy that they use. If it's more expensive, it must be better. Maybe, maybe not. But they went across and they spent twice as much for the hot dog across the street. And so this guy that started Nathan's Hot Dogs, he, he, he came up with an ingenious plan. Here's what his plan was. Down to the local hospital. And he went to all the doctors and the nurses. And here's what he told them. If you'll come to my stand in your hospital attire, doctors in their white jackets, nurses in their scrubs and things like that, if you come to my hot dog stand at lunchtime, I will give you a free hot dog. And all of a sudden, these doctors and these nurses started coming for a quick free hot dog and they're standing around and people are walking by and they're seeing doctors and nurses buying hot dogs for five cents while they're paying 10 cents. And all of a sudden, the mindset of everybody said, there must be nothing wrong with this meat because doctors and nurses wouldn't do that kind of thing. The change of mind. It's an amazing thing. And that's how he became the place to go get your hot dog. So that when the Queen of England came, she was taken to Nathan's Hot Dogs. Nothing was different about the hot dogs he was selling before than after what changed was the minds of the people. Romans chapter 12, that's what God is going to say to us in, in, in our study of this passage, he's going to talk to us about the renewing of the mind, the changing of the mindset that we need to have if we're going to have a victorious Christian life. Now, last week, as we were reflecting on our study in 1 Corinthians, I made a point or a highlighted a point that I want to look just a little bit closer at this week. And that point is this, the truth that is not lived is easily ignored by the one who needs that truth. Now, we stated that as we talked about how we need to be men and women of the Word of God. And as we spend our time this summer, and we got this summer menu, and you can see the connection between a hot dog and a summer menu and all that stuff, but we want us to feed on the Word of God because the Word of God is a central part of renewing of our mind, which is a central part of living victorious. And so we talked about the truth that is not lived is easily ignored by the one who needs the truth. That's true for not only the individual, us, who know truth but don't live it. It becomes easily ignored. It's also true about those who observe us as believers. If we're not living out truth, the truth that we try to proclaim is easily ignored. And so what we have to come to grips with is, is that we must be men and women who live out this truth. Now, we can, we can cry about, we can bemoan the fact that the voice of the church has seemingly been silenced. And we may blame media, and we may blame Hollywood, etc. We may blame all of those things. But in reality, we really only have ourselves to blame. Now, I've been known to say, and I say this often, that I'm a mess, you're a mess. We're all a mess. But God wants to take that mess and make something beautiful out of it. But far too often, our messes only seem to be getting worse, not better. Far too often, we're seeing defeat rather than victory. And the victorious living that the Bible talks about, that we talk about so much ourselves, seems to be an illusion. I know this to be true because I meet with people on a regular basis who say, yes, I believe this, but the reality of my life is this. And there's a dichotomy. There's a distance before, between these two. There's a disconnect between what I say I believe and what I experience. 
We hear Jesus talk about the abundant life. And then yet when we examine our own hearts and lives, we wonder, what is that? What does that look like? I don't know what that means. Or we talk about having victory, and yet many times we seem to be stumbling over the same sin over and over and over again. Or we struggle in our relationships with our husbands and our wives when we know we should be loving, but we, and we know what God tells us. We know as men that we're told to have as our example Jesus Christ, and we're to be living sacrifices to our wives. But when it comes right down to the rubber meeting the road in the daily experience, we're not sacrificing anything. As a matter of fact, the only thing we're really sacrificing is our wives, and vice versa, wives with their husbands, and and parents with their children, and the relationships that we know should be a certain way, they're not. When it comes to living victorious over sin, we know that there are things that we know we shouldn't do. And we spend way too much time in Romans chapter 7 where Paul says, the things that I know I shouldn't do, those are the things that I end up doing. And the things that I know that I should be doing, those are the things that I'm not. Far too often that's our experience, and as a result we feel defeated. We don't understand the whole idea of this victorious life that the Bible talks about. And the dilemma that the church then faces is this. The dilemma the church faces is the contradiction between its beliefs and its behaviors. And the tragic result is the world sees us as hypocrites and we see ourselves as defeated. That's a tragic result. The world sees us as hypocrites because we say we believe this and we live like this. We see ourselves as defeated because we know we ought to be this and we're not. And that's a tragic result. So some of us have relegated our lives to living one way when we're together and pretending and living another way throughout the week. We know this to be true because we see the statistics all the time. And they can be skewed, I understand that. But there's enough smoke out there to know that there's fire. And we're living inconsistent with what we say we believe, and how we think we ought to behave. And this is, this is not what God has called us to. And the only winner in this scenario is Satan. And that's not the victory that Christ intends for us to experience. And so let's spend a little time in this passage of Scripture reorienting. Now this past week we've celebrated, you see the flags around, we celebrated the independence of the United States. We celebrated the independence from the country of England, which we were a colony of. And we celebrated with some difficulty because of the weather that took place this past week. But we, we celebrated in grand fashion. Uh, how many of you went to a fireworks show last night or something like that? I didn't have to. Now, you know, my habit usually on Saturday night is to go to bed at 9 o'clock. I knew that was going to be impossible because I don't live that far from the Shaw Commons. And so I'm laying there in bed waiting for it to be done. I, I mean... If Melody had been there, we'd have gone out and watched them. I, I don't, it's like, okay, yeah, they're going to be red, blue, green, yellows. It's going to blow up. And <sighs> I'm, I'm sure you got excited about it, but it's, it's not a big deal to me. But I'm sitting in my bed, and they're blowing up. It feels like I'm in a war zone. My bed's shaking because it's just right over top of me. I knew there was no going to sleep before 9 o'clock was done. It was going to be more like 9.40 or 45, and then the people who didn't get enough of all the boom booms that went up in the air, then they want to go ahead and blow up all their money for the next hour or so. You know, I, I don't get it. But nonetheless, we celebrated in grand fashion, and, and rightly so, because the independence that we celebrate as a country, that's a big deal. It's a big deal. It, was a, it changed everything. It changed our relationship with England. It changed our relationship as colonies. It changed the direction of our country. And so we celebrated in, a, in, in grand fashion. It was a defining moment. Well, the death of Christ was a defining moment for the believer as well. And it changes everything. It really does. The problem is, is that we don't celebrate it as much as we should because we don't experience it as greatly as we should. 
Christ's victory over sin was a defining moment for us as believers. And constantly, the believer is admonished to live out this victory, uh, no longer walking in the flesh, but walking in the Spirit. We've been made new creatures, we were told by Paul in Corinthians, in Christ Jesus, and we're no longer slaves to sin, Romans chapter 6 talks about. This is the victory that we have. This is the victory that Christ has secured for us. Far too often, at times, we don't experience it, and the result can be quite ugly and devastating. So why is this? What needs to take place in order for us to experience the victory that God has, or that Christ has secured for us? The bottom line is we need to change our thinking. That's what Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, is driving us to. So let's look at these, these verses. Very short. Just follow along as I read. We are very familiar with them. Many of us could quote them. And because they're so well known and so easily quoted, they can be easily forgotten as well. Or you could say, yeah, I know that. I know what this is. Let's allow the Spirit of God to work as we look at these, this passage anew and afresh. Here's what Paul says in verse 12, or chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, I beseech you, I beg of you is the idea, you brethren. Now, I just want to stop right there before we go any further, just to throw in this little side note. Why is Paul exhorting? Why is Paul showing such urgency? I think Paul is doing that because he understands the gravity of what he said in chapters 1 through 11, and he also understands the tendency of humans to forget the importance of what is said in chapters 1 through 11 and the reality that we might not live out the truth of the victory that God has secured. So Paul here is exhorting, he's begging, he's beseeching, he is pleading with him. I therefore urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Or the better way of translating it might be reasonable way of worship. It's the only reasonable way to respond to all that God has done to us, is that we give ourselves as a living sacrifice. And then verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able to prove what, is the will, what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. If we want to know how to live victorious, victorious isn't having a whole lot of stuff. Victorious isn't having all of life to go perfect. Victorious is knowing what is the good and perfect and acceptable will of God. That's what victorious is about. And so that's what Paul wants us to see here. Now, as we look at this passage of Scripture, what we want to make sure we understand is that there's, there's potential for victorious living. That's what Paul talks about in the first part of verse 1, the potential for living victorious. And then he's going to talk about the pathway in the latter part of verse 1 and, and first part of uh, verse 2, the pathway to this victorious Christian living. And then he's going to share with us the provision that takes place. Very simple. The the potential, the pathway, vision. And so let's look back at verse 1 again and see the potentials. And that's, that's what I want you to see because there's potential killer and there's potential enabler. What do I mean by that? Potential killer is, is that what Paul's saying here is this renewed mind, this victory life that we talked about, this, this ability to discern what it is that God wants me to do each and every day, how God wants me to live, to determine the perfect will of God, so to speak. How do I get that? Well, there's a potential killer to that kind of victory that Paul promises, that God desires for us. And the potential killer is this. Notice it says, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. The mercies of God throws us back into chapter 11, and really all of chapter 1 through 11. Notice, if you will, with me, if, if you'll look back in, in verse 28 of chapter 11, listen to what Paul has just said. Because the therefore is therefore a reason. 
And so verse 28, it says this, from the standpoint of the gospel, they, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience. So these also now have been disobedient that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may be shown mercy. Now Paul's been talking about the struggle of the, the Jewish nation and their rejection of the gospel and whatnot. But Paul is emphasizing this idea of mercy. And it says in verse 31, we'll continue. So these all meaning that because of mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. Oh, the depths and the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And what Paul has been talking about is, in a sense, the mercy of God. Chapters 1 through 3, he talks about the fact that we're all sinners. We're all disobedient. We all fall short. There is no one alive today who can measure up to the standard of God's perfection in our everyday lives. We're all sinners. That's what he tells us in chapters 1 through 3. All have fallen short of the glory of God. And you might be able to say, but Pastor Tally, I live a certain way. I, I, I do some good things. I'm not all bad. Great. But it's not enough. That's the problem that man has. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, we have no hope in and of ourselves of eternal existence with God because we fall short of the glory of God. But then he talks about the good news. In chapter 4, he starts talking about the justification of the justification by faith. And he gives us the example of Abraham. How was Abraham saved? He was saved by faith because that's how God saves everyone. We believe in God and we believe in his son, Jesus Christ, who, who died on the cross for our sins, who paid the penalty for our sins to make us new in him, who we have been clothed in his righteousness. That's what Paul's been talking about. Then he talks about the sanctification process, that God is in the process of molding us into his image. And we're not to yield our members as instruments of unrighteousness, chapter 6. And so we have this great and grandiose treatment of the theology that we're sinners, but Christ has died to justify us, and Christ has given us the opportunity to become more like him through the sanctification process, and then there's coming a future glorification. And so Paul now says, listen, if you want to know what the will of God is, if you want to be able to figure out how to live in victory, you need to understand it's built on, first and foremost, the mercies of God. God's mercy is what enables us. It's not, we are not going to be able to do it ourselves. It's what God does for us. And so the mercies of God are, 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 are the basis on which we come to Him. It's because of His mercy that we fall on our knees before Him. We confess our sins. We repent of our sins. And we claim the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for the salvation of our souls. And that's what gives us the opportunity, the potential for living victorious. What am I trying to say? The victorious life is not a life we can generate in and of ourselves. The victorious life is not a life we can generate. We have to be regenerated. We have to be born again, to use Jesus' um, analogy in John chapter 3. We have to be made new in Christ Jesus. We have to come to Christ and receive his mercy. That's what the word of God tells us. And so Paul says, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. So if you stand here today or sit here today and you're here to try to reform yourself, you're here to try to figure out how to live well enough for God to accept you, I have good news and I have bad news. 
The good news is God has prepared a way for you to be good enough to experience God in a relationship. I have bad news. If you're trying to do it on your own, you're going to fail miserably because we all fall short. That's the killer. We want to do it ourselves. We want to figure it out. We think by going to church or doing this or taking care of this that somehow we're going to be able to live life well enough. The answer is no, you can't. You can't. The good news is God has prepared a way for us. Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. That's the enabler. It's God's mercy. That's the good news. That's the gospel in a nutshell. That's what we're going to celebrate in just a moment. Christ shed his blood. He gave his life for us. That's what we have. That's the benefit. So there is potential for victorious living, but it starts with a relationship with God. We can't do it on our own. We can't reform ourselves. We can't figure out the best way to live life so we make our way there. It's not going to happen. It can't happen. Because we're all sinners. That's what Romans has been telling us. And so, as we look at this passage of Scripture, we have to recognize there's potential. But if I don't follow on the mercies of God, I will never reach that potential. And so, that's the potential that's there. There's a pathway that now, as Paul talks about, to this victorious Christian living. And it's very simple. We know this. It's not something that you haven't heard before. There's the presentation, there's the protection, and then there's the correction. The presentation is that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. When we come to God and we fall upon His mercies, we are presenting our lives. God, I can't fix my mess. I am a mess. I recognize it. I need you. I need your mercy. So we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, which is counterintuitive because in the sacrifice, the sacrifice is actually killed, but we're, God's calling us to live as sacrifice. We are to die to self daily. This is an act that we are to do. God, I'm yours. I give my life to you to do as you please. But then he also says that's the presentation, but he also wants to know the, 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 the protection that we need. And do not be conformed to this world. The, the word conform means to be pressed into a mold. Don't allow the world to affect you. Don't allow the world to form you. Don't allow the world to press you into its mold. And constantly, that's what the world, Satan, and the flesh are trying to do. Conform us to its way of thinking rather than allowing the Spirit of God to conform us to Him. And so we're told not to be conformed, not to allow the world to press in on us. But the real problem is, how do we do that? And we're constantly being bombarded by messages from the world. And sadly enough, they're starting to filter their way into the church, and, and the way the church is beginning to think is being formed more by the world than by the Word of God. How, how do we stop that onslaught? How do we stop that? Because it's happening, and, and we're seeing ourselves being corrupted by the world and the flesh and the devil, and we're struggling. We know it. We know we're struggling. I hear this a lot. Pastor, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I, I just can't seem to get there. Or I, I, I keep struggling with the same thing over and over and over again. It's pressing me into its mold. It's conforming me to its image. Rather than becoming more like Christ, I'm becoming more like this. That's the, that's the danger. And so what Paul wants us to drive to, and one of the key parts of this is we need to be corrected. We need to have our minds renewed. And here's the a, here's a thing that I want you to understand. This, this renewing of the mind, it's not, again, it's not something that you and I are going to be able to do. The Greek language helps us understand this. Because the author, Paul, puts it in the passive tense. And passive tense, I've told you this before. And I don't want to bore you with the Greek language. I don't understand enough of it to even you know, work my way out of a wet paper bag. But you know, I, I, I do know this. The passive tense means that there's an outside force that's going to be applying force to you. The renewal of the mind is going to be something that 
God and His Word does to us. The conforming to the world is going to be something that the world does to us. That's why the Word of God tells us to drink deeply in His Word, to allow the Word to wash us. Why we're told to hide God's Word in our heart. Why? That we might not sin against Him. The Word has a cleansing effect. It's the renewal of the mind. We have to correct the way we think because we think wrong. Now, I've got a couple of charts that I want to show you here that I think helps us see what we do. In the, in the church, we spend way too much time talking about the, the negative feelings, sinful feelings. I hear, I hear this in counseling a lot. Pastor, I'm just not sure I love such and such a person anymore. That's dealing on the feelings. Well, sometimes some people say, well, you just got to love them. Well, I don't feel like loving them. Or it may be somebody that you've had a problem with, you're having to struggle with dealing with. You say, well, I just, I just can't bring myself, I can't, I can't do it. I know what God's word says. I know that even as Christ forgave us, so also we ought to forgive others. I, I get that, I understand that, but I, I just can't find the feeling to do that. Spend a lot of time talking about feelings. Or we spend a lot of time dealing and identifying wrong behaviors. And we, we set up all kinds of rules. Boy, if we could just set up more rules, if we, you know, if we just have this, man, man, well, then everything will be fixed. It didn't work for the monasteries. It's not going to work for us. There's a reason why legalism doesn't lead to holiness. Now, again, I've said this over and over again, and I'm, I, I, I want to keep repeating it so I don't get misunderstood. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have rules. I think some things God says here are very clear. Thou shalt not. But if we are constantly focused on the feelings and the behaviors, we're never going to fix the problem because the problem isn't our feelings and our behaviors. Or at least that's not where it starts. Where it starts is in the mind. We have wrong thinking. That's why we can say, I know what God's word says, but... That's why the psalmist in Psalm 73 says, God is good, and he's good to Israel, but as for me, and that's where we live sometimes. Am I right? Am I right? Yeah, we live there. This is a struggle. I don't feel like going to church today. Or I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel. Or... I just need to put more rules in my life. I just need to have more parameters. I just need to nail this down further and further. It doesn't take care of the problem because the problem is the mind. The problem is the way we think. And that's what Paul wants us to get to. So there's a second chart that I want you to see that helps us understand what Paul's talking about, this renewing of the mind. And so what he wants to say is, is that as we renew the mind, as we allow God's word and God's spirit to control us. That's why the Paul says that if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's a spiritual thing that has to happen. We have to be guided by His Spirit. But the Word of God also says we can quench it. We can throw a wet blanket over what the Spirit's trying to do. We can ignore the Word of God, which has given us instruction, which has given us strength and encouragement. We can ignore all that thing, but we've got to deal with our thinking. Our thinking is wrong. Therein lies our problem. And that's what this guy did with hot dogs years and years ago. He figured out people were thinking my product is bad, so i got to change the thinking. He understood a principle here that God's given us to us as well. The reason why we're not experiencing victory is because we are living in defeat. Why are we living in defeat? Because we're thinking wrong. We're not allowing the Word of God and the Spirit of God to direct us and to correct us and to guide us. That's why we don't know what the good and perfect will of God is, because we're not thinking correctly. That's what he's trying to get us to see. We're missing it. We're missing it because our minds have not been renewed. And when our not minds are renewed, then we can plan out right behavior. If I understand that God is the rewarder of those who faithfully serve him, if I understand that God is going to bless me, if I understand that God is going to take care of me, if I understand these things, then I can step out on faith and I can do what God calls me to do regardless of what my fears may be because I know God will take care of me. 
If I'm struggling with what to do and how to do it, I can go to God. And here's what the Word of God says. If any of you lack wisdom, James chapter 1, go to God and ask, and He will give it liberally. He does not abrade. He doesn't come mad at you. He desires to give us wisdom. That's what the Word of God says. But far too often when we're stuck in a problem, we're not sure what to do, we just work harder, try to do more. We seek advice of everybody else but God. Nine times out of ten, when somebody comes to me in a spiritual problem, I ask them this one question. How's your relationship with the Lord going? If they're in trouble, nine times out of ten, what they're going to tell me is not very good. I'm not spending time in His Word. I'm not spending time doing this. I need to get back to doing that. Now, again, your little devotional thing that we gave you, reading a passage of Scripture isn't a panacea. It's not going to necessarily take care of all your problems. We've got to continue to renew our minds. Our minds have to be cleansed. That can only be done by the power of God's Word and the power of His Spirit. And, but once we have right thinking, we can plan right behavior, and then we can see the right feelings. When we're living out truth, there's a joy. When the Bible says we cast all our cares upon him for he cares for you, when we, we experience the peace that passes all understanding, why is that? That's because we've surrendered our lives to him. We've made the presentation. We've got the right thinking. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 37 says, fret not, don't worry. We're, we're paralyzed. Because our thinking is wrong. And when our thinking is wrong, then our behaviors become wrong. And when our behaviors become wrong, our feelings become wrong. Every aspect of life fits into this. And so we need to recognize what God is doing to us here. He's given us a pathway. The pathway is we present ourselves as a living sacrifice. That says, God, my life is yours. What you say, I will do. Where you lead, I will go. What you want, I will give. That's presentation. Protection. I am not going to follow the Lord. I mean, follow the world. I'm going to follow the Lord. We just sang about it. I'm not going to be conformed to the image of this world, but I'm going to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I'm going to correct my mind. I'm going to think correctly. I'm going to dig into his word. I'm going to understand what God wants and how God wants it. I'm going to live that way. And I'm going to be able to do it because you are going to change my not mind. You're going to renew me from the inside out. You're going to take care of me. You're going to do it. And I'm presenting myself to you. And I'm committing not to allow the world to take over, but allow your spirit and your word to guide me. And then when we get to the latter part of verse 2, it all makes sense. And here's what he says. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of the mind. And then he goes, so that, here's the result. Here's the provision. If I present my body and I refuse to be conformed, allow the world to conform me, but I will be renewed in our, my mind. I will allow God's word and his spirit to guide and direct me. When I do all that by the renewing of my mind, the result will be that I will prove what, is the, good, what, what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Good is the right thing. Acceptable is what God wants. Perfect, complete, not half, it's complete. And so if we've lived in defeat, we're not going to necessarily have a revolutionary change sometimes overnight, but it's not going to happen at all until we come back to the truth of God's word, which says that we are to live out this good an acceptable and perfect will of God. And how does that happen? It comes by the renewing of our mind. And here's what I want you to see. And I want to close with this. This is this. The victorious life that we strive for can only be had for mind. The lies we believe keep us from the victory that we want. The lies that we believe. And here's what I want you to understand. Every time, we do something that we know is contrary to what God's word says. We are believing a lie. We are presenting our bodies to an idol. We are not surrendering. 
It's a daily battle. Constant renewing the mind. That's what God calls us. That's what leads to victory. That will be the result. It's not talking about having big cars and big houses. It's not talking about necessarily having a carefree life. It's not talking about having a problem-free life. God actually uses difficulty to bring us closer to Him. Just talk to the children of Israel. God is in the process of conforming us to His image, and He will do whatever He desires to bring about that process. So we're not talking about living the life of Riley here. What we are talking about is understanding what does God want from me today? That only happens when I'm willing to present myself a living sacrifice, allowing my mind to be renewed so that I will know what the will of God is, that good and acceptable, perfect will. That's what we come to as we look at this, pass, uh, as we look at this table. We come to an opportunity where we have the opportunity to celebrate the sacrifice that God gave nor made for us. He made the victory possible. How did he make it possible? He made it possible through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which we celebrate in the cup. He made it possibly possible through the giving of his life. He became a man in order that we might experience victory, not defeat. And so as we come to this time this morning, I want us to con contemplate in our hearts I want us to spend some time in quiet as the men prepare, and then I want us to celebrate the victory that God has given us through His Son, Jesus Christ. So let's just pause, and if you've been struggling with victory in your life, and perhaps there's a known sin, perhaps there's something that you've been struggling with, or, 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 or whatever it may be, go to God and, and, and surrender that to God and prepare your heart for worshiping Him and giving thanks for the sacrifice he has made. So let's just have a moment of silence.